This lecture will show you how a removable partial denture is constructed when you send the master cast with the design on it to the laboratory. The first step is to apply block out and relief to the designed master cast. We'll talk about this more as we go through the lecture. The laboratory may choose not to use the dentist designed master cast, in which case they make a duplicate on which to do the following steps. Here we have our master cast that was created after we did our rest preps on our patient. We took a new impression, poured a master cast, and then surveyed and designed this cast. Hopefully all the proper contours were achieved with our mouth preparations, or we may have to get the patient back in, make some changes, and then do another master cast and drawing. Our last picture was that of the master cast of the maxilla. This one shows the mandible with the final survey and design on it. The definition of block out is any undercut area, the area below the survey line, that will be crossed by a rigid part of the partial framework must be eliminated by the use of block out. Any area that the framework crosses except the terminal one-third of the retentive arm or the retentive part of the bar clasp must have the undercut blocked out with wax. In other words, what we have to do is we have to create an undercut free cast with wax placed into any undercut except for the terminal thirds of those retentive arms. Arbitrary blockout or convenience blockout is done in those areas that are not crossed by the framework during seating or removal of the partial denture, but are blocked out arbitrarily for the convenience of, say, making an impression. Arbitrary blockout is done in gingival crevices, under growth tissue and bony undercuts, or labial to the buccal tooth and tissue undercuts. Let's talk about various types of blockout. First, there's arbitrary or convenience blockout. It may be placed in, say, the gingival crevices, gross tissue or bony undercuts not involved or crossed by the framework pattern. Its purpose is to facilitate the production of the framework or the impression. Next, we have parallel blockout. It is necessary for all undercut areas that will be crossed by the framework. The surveyor is used to identify these. They include the proximal surfaces used as guiding planes, beneath minor connectors, tissue undercuts crossed by the framework, deep interproximal spaces covered by minor connectors or lingual plates, and the gingival crevices crossed by the bar clasp arm. An example of parallel blockout is that the proximal surfaces of all the teeth next to the edentulous areas where guide plates must rest are blocked out parallel to the path of insertion using the surveyor. Wax is placed below the survey line and then the surveyor is used with the carving tool to bring the wax back to the surface of the tooth. On the lingual of tooth number 28 and 29, the metal plating crosses an area of undercut. It must be blocked out parallel from the survey line down to the gingival area. Also note the gingival crevices and the undercuts crossed by the major and minor connector of number 28 and 29 are all blocked out parallel from the survey line to the gingival margin. After all the block out and relief is completed on the master cast, an impression is made of this prepared cast and a new cast is poured in investment material. This new cast, the refractory cast, is the one on which the framework wax pattern will be placed and cast. This slide shows the effect of parallel block out on the refractory cast. Note 3a. The proximal surface of that tooth no longer has an undercut on the refractory cast. Also, the lingual surface of the tooth no undercut exists because of parallel block out from the survey line to the gingival area. It has eliminated the undercut. 
Now look at the CAS framework in the picture on the right. That has been placed back onto your master cast. The proximal plate does not go into the undercut on the proximal surface of the tooth. This is because that framework wax pattern was created on a cast that had no undercut there. Remember, the rigid parts of the framework cannot go into an undercut. It wouldn't seat. A third type of blockout is shaped blockout. Ledges are created on the buccal and lingual surfaces of the clasped abutment teeth on the master cast. When the refractory cast is made, these ledges help tell the laboratory technician where to place the frame wax patterns for the direct retainers and reciprocal components. Shaped blockout is created on the buccal and lingual surfaces of the abutment tooth where clasp arms are located on your framework design. A ledge is created that will show the laboratory technician where to place the direct retainer or reciprocal arm on the refractory cast. Here's another view where you can see the lingual aspect of number 18 and the ledge that has been created at that point. Here's a close-up of the shape blockout created on the buccal and lingual surfaces of the abutment tooth with clasp arms. The ledge will show the lab tech where to place the direct retainer and reciprocal component. Remember, the refractory cast has no undercuts, so the lab tech needs assistance to know where to place the component parts of the wax pattern. After blockout is completed, relief must be applied to the master cast to produce relief or a space to protect from tissue impingement. Areas where wax is applied to create a space, for example, are under the a base attachment minor connector. This space creates room for acrylic resin to flow under the base attachment to lock on the teeth and denture base. It's also placed under the mandibular major connector and under the approach arms for bar clasp. Here's a summary of where relief is needed. It is placed beneath lingual bar major connectors or the lower portion of the lingual plate major connector. It's beneath areas in which the major connector will contact thin tissue such as the median palatal suture or the palatal torus. It's also placed beneath base attachment areas on the ridge where space is needed to attach the denture base and teeth. And finally, under approach arms for bar clasp, these are especially needed on extension base RPD designs. The lingual bar or lingual plate major connector will contact thin, delicate tissues on the mandible if relief is not used. This is especially true on the extension base designs where the partial may rotate somewhat. One layer of 32 gauge relief wax is placed on the tissue slope, lingual to the teeth, and beneath the major connector. To make a space under base attachment for placement of acrylic resin on the final RPD, two sheets of 20 gauge wax are placed as relief over the residual ridges, C2D above. Proper placement of this wax helps create the internal finish line on the framework. Note that there would be a little ledge where the relief of the base attachment area joins the relief of the major connector. The relief over the distal extension area where you have drawn your base attachment creates a raised area on the refractory cast. The framework wax pattern will be created on this refractory cast. On the finished cast framework seen in the lower right, you can see a measured space under the base attachment. This space allows resin to flow under the framework to retain the base and teeth. The relief is removed in an area about three millimeters by three millimeters on the crest of the ridge where the processing stop or cast stop is drawn on the framework design. It is located approximately two thirds of the way back to the beginning of the retromolar pad, which is where the usual base attachment ends on mandibular. This will produce an indentation in the relief on the refractory cast down to the level of the cast itself. The cast framework will touch the cast in this area after it's fabricated. 
The metal cast stop or processing stop prevents rotation of the framework during the packing of acrylic, which is done under about 3,000 pounds of pressure. It maintains the spacing under the base attachment and allows acrylic to flow under the base attachment. A processing stop, three millimeters by three millimeters, touches the ridge and prevents the framework from depressing when acrylic resin is packed into the area under 3,000 pounds of pressure. See the arrow for its location. It should be on the crest of the ridge and not on the side of the ridge where it could slide downward on pressure. You've created an inclined plane. The final processing of acrylic resin is done on the master cast or a duplicate. It's not done on the refractory cast. Relief allows for an adequate thickness of acrylic resin beneath the base attachment area of the framework. It's necessary to retain the teeth and the base. The acrylic resin will be approximately 1.5 millimeters thick when the proper relief is provided during the construction of the RPD framework. Adjustment may be made to the tissue side of the acrylic resin without exposing the framework. The processing stop or cast stop may also be exposed during processing. Some patients see this metal and think that there's a problem and you may need to explain how the framework is made and why that might be exposed, that it's not a problem. As a rule, no relief is placed under the maxillary major connector and slight relief may be placed over a palatal torus or a strong median palatal refae. No processing stop is required on the maxillary distal extension RPD if an anterior posterior palatal strap or a palatal plate major connector is present because the major connector rests directly on the palate and it acts as a stop to prevent rotation of the framework during processing of acrylic on the master cast or its duplicate. If a horseshoe or U-shaped major connector is designed, a processing stop or cast stop is necessary to keep the major connector from possible movement during processing. Our textbook indicates a cast stop on the crest of the ridge at the posterior area of the base attachment, which usually extends to the posterior ridge just anterior to the hamular notch. It should be on the crest of the ridge and not on an incline. I think it's probably easier just to say we put one on all frameworks and not take the chance of forgetting or having to even think about which major connector we're using. The lingual bar or lingual plate major connector will contact thin, delicate tissue that's very sensitive on the mandible if relief is not placed to create a slight space under it. One layer of 32 gauge relief wax is placed on the tissue slope, lingual to the teeth and beneath the major connector. The arrow indicates the extent of the major connector on this particular cast design. Relief wax produces a raised area on the refractory cast upon which the framework major connector wax pattern will be placed. The end result is the creation of a slight space under the major connector Therefore, there will be less pressure on the tissue when the framework depresses under occlusal forces. This is absolutely critical on extension base RPD designs. Later on after a partial has been delivered, oftentimes you will see a sore on the lingual behind the anterior teeth. Sometimes this is because the ridge has resorbed and the partial denture is rotating more and the framework is digging into those tissues. So it's not often that it necessarily needs to have an adjustment done to the framework, but in fact, what probably needs to happen is that the framework be, or the partial denture be relined. Relief wax is placed from the gingival margin to the floor of the mouth under the mandibular lingual plate or lingual bar major connector. It is not added to the area over the teeth under the lingual plate major connector. The lingual plate major connector must touch the teeth at its superior border to prevent food and debris from packing between the teeth and the major connector. If it does pack food, it will cause a discomfort for the patient and an unhygienic situation. In summary, relief is applied only to the soft tissue areas under the mandibular major connector. 
One layer of relief wax is placed under approach arms of bar clasp that are on the distal extension sides of the removable partial denture Kennedy class 1 and 2 designs. The gingival margin is blocked out parallel, and the parallel block out under the bar clasp extends to the position of the .01 undercut. The .01 undercut must not be blocked out or relieved, or we will lose the retention for our bar clasp. As a rule, relief is not placed under the maxillary major connector. It contacts the tissues. It can be allowed to do this because the tissues of the palate are tough, keratinized tissues that can withstand the pressures of the partial denture under function. The exceptions to this statement would be if we have a strong median palatal suture or palatal torus. We sometimes place a thin layer of relief over these prominent anatomic structures where the gingiva is very thin and prone to discomfort and irritation by the major connector. We do place beading along the borders of the major connector to prevent food from getting under the framework. This is produced by placing a groove using a spoon excavator or a small cleoid discoid. We cut a rounded indentation along the borders of the major connector including the area where we dip down on the lingual of the premolar. It is cut about one millimeter in depth. The end result will be that there will be a little positive bead around the inside of the RPD maxillary framework that helps prevent impaction of food. After we have blocked out and relieved our master cast, the next step is the duplication of the blocked out and relieved master cast to produce a refractory cast on which to wax our framework. The laboratory technician places the blocked out and relieved master cast into a duplication flask. He then uses reversible hydrocolloid material to produce a mold for the refractory cast. The mold is then filled with an investment material. The metals that we use require a high heat investment material to be poured into the mold. Each company providing the metal has suggested materials that are compatible with their metals and equipment. The water powder ratio is critical to the production of a good cast. The laboratory technician will trim the cast and then it will be ready to place a framework wax pattern on it. The laboratory will fabricate a wax pattern for the framework and often uses preformed patterns for some of the component parts. On this slide you can see some of the patterns that are available for the laboratory to purchase and use in the development of wax patterns for frameworks. The laboratory uses the refractory cast and places a tacky liquid on the cast to aid in holding the preformed patterns to it. In the upper left picture, you can see that the lab has placed a major connector pattern on the cast, which also has the internal and external finish lines and base attachment incorporated to it. They can split the pattern and adjust it to any desired length, depending on the size of the arch. In the picture to the far right, you see a completed pattern. Thin measured sheets of wax are cut to form the lingual plate major connector. The rest areas must be waxed without a pattern. In the middle bottom picture, a modified T-bar has been added to the refractory cast. The position, by the way, of that modified T-bar is really not in the correct position. The last picture shows the cast now has a hole in it and is ready for casting the framework. These pictures show wax patterns that have been formed by our students. We used to wax up frameworks in this course. These are some of the nice patterns that have been done by them. This particular slide shows major connectors. Note on the right picture, the patient's right side has the major connector dipping down to avoid two of the posterior teeth. This area could have also been plated. Observe at the red arrows how the wax has been formed to create a butt joint 
so that the acrylic will form a smooth transition when it's placed in this area. Note the green arrows and it just shows a different type of base attachment that can be used when, uh, when they use those stock patterns to create base attachment. On the left, notice that the major connector extends posteriorly to the second molar. Using this design allows the major connector to be very thin in that area. The lower border should be positioned close to the functional floor of the mouth. It must be a minimum of 5 millimeters in width to where the butt joint is created for a smooth transition of acrylic resin to the major connector. On the right, note that the lower border of the major connector has been placed close to the functional floor of the mouth. The base attachment starts 2 millimeters above the inferior border of the major connector. It joins here in order to make the area strong enough by having enough connection to the guide plate and to the major connector. By coming up two millimeters from the bottom of the major connector to the start of the base attachment, we allow room for acrylic to be completely flowed around the base attachment and for it to become confluent with the lower border of the major connector. Once the framework wax pattern is complete, we're ready for step four, which is to sprue, invest, and cast the framework. The refractory cast is prepared for a sprue by placing a hole in the cast. The sprue hole can be made at the time the refractory cast is poured using a sprue former. A sprue is then placed in the prepared area. Auxiliary sprues are then added to assure complete casting of metal into the casting ring investment pattern. The casting ring is prepared by placing a spacer as shown in A. A cross section of what it looks like in the casting ring is shown in B. You have the cast on the bottom which has the pattern on it. That area sticking up above the pattern would be those auxiliary sprues that we added that lead to the sprue former or the top of the casting ring. Then investment is vibrated into the casting ring as shown in C until it's full and the lid is placed on it. After the investment is set and the lid is taken off, you have what is shown to the right, which is ready for burnout and casting. If the lost wax technique is used, the investment ring is placed into an oven and heated to a specific temperature where the wax pattern is burned out and the investment is brought to a temperature necessary to cast a specific metal being used for the framework. The metal is then heated until it's melted and by use of the casting machine it is thrown into the investment ring. The ring with the cast metal framework is shown in the lower right picture. The ring is then placed in water and the investment is separated from the cast framework. Shown in the picture is the induction casting machine that is most often used today for casting the framework. This particular framework was cast in gold. You can see how it has been removed from the investment and cleaned up. This is rarely used today because of the expense, but the process for producing a framework is similar. A lot of work is being done using the CAD CAM to produce a framework. You will be receiving a lecture on this next semester. All of the sprues must be removed and the framework is then polished and taken back to the master cast for delivery to the dentist. The final polished framework is shown here on the master cast. It is returned to the dentist for try-in. We are now ready for step four, which is trying the framework in the patient's mouth. The framework is then taken back to the patient for try-in. It must fit the patient the same as it does on the master cast. It may need to be adjusted slightly so that the components fit the patient accurately. Detex spray is used on the inner surface of the framework to detect pressure spots preventing seating. When a framework is returned from the laboratory, you should have a quality checklist for that framework. The first thing might be the wrought wire clasp. 
is the solder joint approximately a centimeter from the actual abutment tooth? If it is soldered right next to the abutment tooth, that wire has been heated sufficiently to affect the flexibility of the clasp at that point. Is the wrought wire clasp into a .02 undercut? Check the base attachment. The framework will fracture during function if the junction between the major connector and the minor connector or the base attachment is not of sufficient bulk and quantity. The direct retainer size and taper should be checked. A molar is approximately 2.5 millimeters at its origin and tapers down to 1 millimeter at the terminal end. The premolar is approximately 2 millimeters at its origin and tapers down to 1 millimeter at its terminal end. Check to see that the direct retainer arm is into an undercut. We receive frameworks back frequently where the arm is not into an undercut at all. Now sometimes that has been worn off of your uh, master cast and it has to be checked in, in the mouth. But if it's not into an undercut, it's going to be a very ineffective framework. The reciprocal component, on the other hand, should be completely above the survey line and should be of uniform width from its origin to its terminus. The internal surfaces of the cast circumferential clasp should be polished. There should not be any rough areas that will affect the surface of the tooth or of a crown if that happens to be a cast C on a crown. The terminus should not be a blunt, rough area. It should be tapered from the external surface to the internal surface. Check your bar clasp arms. They should not be standing out away from the tissues in such a manner as shown in this picture. That will cause chronic irritation of the mucosa in the cheek area. When you dip down to avoid the marginal gingiva, on the maxillary arch, you should dip down six millimeters. On the mandibular arch, four millimeters. These cases show insufficient dipping down on the lingual. On the one on the left, not only did it not dip down quite far enough, the major problem here was the fact that it was a ledge. It was just like a shelf that you could put a book, set of books on. That should fade out to very thin metal. Not, not a knife edge, which would be very sharp, but it should thin out and become uh, confluent almost with the gingiva. There are different philosophies on guide plane preparation. On the extension base area where bar clasps are to be used, we would like to see the guide plane be prepared two to three millimeters from the marginal ridge cervically with a tapered diamond held parallel to the path of insertion of the partial. The slight taper of the burr prepares a guide plane with a slight taper. The guide plate should be placed to touch the tooth through an area of 1 to 2 millimeters above the lower border of the guide plane. The proximal surface of the tooth should be blocked out parallel from the survey line cervically. The guide plate on a tooth supported area may touch the tooth through a larger area of 3 to 4 millimeters. The cervical one third of the guide plate should have a space for escape of plaque and debris when the framework is seated. We do not recommend a guide plate touch the tooth to the cervical margin as shown in the bottom right picture. This enables plaque and debris to be directed into the gingival sulcus. A guiding plate should be half the width of the tooth from cuss tip to cuss tip. The minimum contact on the support area of the tooth above the survey line should be one to two millimeters. The cervical portion should have some relief so as not to pack material into the sulcus. On the extension base type of partial, where the bar clasp is used, it should extend lingually to a position past the height of contour buckle lingually in order to aid in reciprocation. The external finish line on the maxillary RPD should extend just lingual to the hamular notch area. The acrylic resin should extend into the hamular notch area to provide maximum support for the prosthesis. 
An exception to this would be if a metal base partial is created where the metal would extend all the way into the hamular notch area. 14 questions will be given to you to see if you understand framework construction. You may have to pause the tape between questions in order to have enough time to read and ponder the questions. Record your answers. An answer sheet is given on the last slide. I hope you've had an aha moment during this presentation in regards to the construction of the RPD framework. Have a great day.